Tena koto te fano o Auckland Unitarian. Tena koto na manuhiri. Nao mai haere mai ki tenei fare karakia o te atua. Tena koto tena tato katoa. Good morning, everyone, and I am very happy to welcome you once again into this space that has been made sacred by Auckland Unitarians for just a little shy of 119 years. We gather to worship, our hearts alive with hope that here we will truly be seen, that here we will be welcomed into the garden of this community where the simple and the elegant, the fluted and the frilled, the shy and the dramatic complement one another and are treasured. May we know that here, each contributes in their way to the beauty of the whole. Come, let us worship together. All genders, sexualities, politics, clappers and non-clappers, progressive and conservative, may we root ourselves in the values of this faith, compassion and courage, transcendence, justice, and transformation. And of course, I would like to remind you that all are invited to join us for morning tea immediately following the service. That is our sacrament of hospitality. Please join us. It definitely wouldn't be complete without you. <clears throat> In preparing my notes today, one of the things I failed to do was note the attributions for all of these wonderful sets of words that I got from the UU website. So just in the interest of at least giving credit where it's due, they are not my words. I did copy them from the website. I just don't, re I didn't record who wrote them. <laughs> and for my opening words, I selected these. Let us wake up, not just from the Sunday morning exhaustion, from the wish for a few more drowsy minutes in bed. Let us wake up to this world we live in, to its beauty and wonder, and also to its tragedy and pain. We must wake up to this reality that not all in our world have what we do, however much or little that is. We must wake up to the idea that our wholeness, our lives, are only as complete as the lives of those around us, of those we are inextricably tied to in a great web of mutuality of which all of us are part. We must hashtag stay woke, in the words of our friends and colleagues involved in Black Lives Matter, working every day for racial justice in our country. Let us wake up, let us stay awake, let us stay woke. And now, in this time and place, let us worship together. We light this chalice to celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of every person, to reaffirm the historic pledge of liberal, liberal religion, to seek that justice which transcends mere legality and moves toward the resolution of true equality, and to share that love which is ultimately beyond even our cherished reason, that love which unites us. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I found Chelsea Handler's latest documentary, Hello Privilege, It's Me, Chelsea, on Netflix, and I watched it. While it's by no means a cinematic masterpiece, Hello Privilege contains some truths that I found challenging to hear. In introducing her project, Handler had this to say, I was white and I was pretty, and I had a big mouth. And for some reason, that was rewarded in Hollywood. I just never really questioned anything because I thought I deserved everything. I'm clearly the beneficiary of white privilege, and I want to know what my personal responsibility is moving forward in the world that we live in today where race is concerned. 
I want to know how to be a better white person to people of color. That's something I want to know too. As part of the documentary, Handler arranged to visit a student open mic night hosted by a professor at the University of Southern California. Reactions to her presence were mixed. Some even feeling embarrassed and offended that she was there. One spoken word response was given by a black male student. What is white privilege? Shit. What isn't white privilege? Every morning I wake up a conscious reminder of how little I'm valued in society. If you only knew the routine performance I'm forced to put on to daily to accommodate your fragility, from changing the way I walk and talk to making you to making you feel less intimidated, as if my race isn't the real reason you fear me and I'm incriminated. Another student offered this comment. One of the things I've noticed in conversations on white privilege is that it always ends up being about people of color's experience. It comes to here and it stays here and it never becomes about whiteness. And I think that's one of the things when you ask what can I or what can the we that is collectively identifying as white do, you do need to learn about others, but you also have to learn about yourself. After leaving that event, Handler remarks that black people are sick and tired of being asked questions about white people's problems. We need to talk to people who are white and, and stop asking black people to solve our problems because it's a white person's problem. Interestingly, this precisely mirrors something Toni Morrison said in 1993. If you can only be tall because someone's on their knees, then you have a serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem and they should start thinking about what they can do about it. Take me out of it. That was the first thing that hit me about this is, I was one of those people going, oh, okay, I get it. I have privilege. Now, what do you want? And then to hear that, that we can't expect non-whites to answer it. It has to come from us. It has to be action from whites. Tim Wise, author of several books on the topic of race in America, also offers his perspective on whose problem it is. White privilege is a white person's problem that has consequences for people of color. I mean, it becomes a problem for black and brown folk because we don't deal with it, right? If we'd deal with it, it wouldn't be a problem. But you can't solve a problem that you won't name or that you won't even recognize is real. That recognition is something that took me a long time. Growing up, I never believed I had any sort of privilege. I grew up in a working class family. My father died when I was young, after which my mother and I relied on social security and food stamps just to get by. In my hometown, there was precisely one very rich family. They were privileged, not us. Eventually, though, I came to realize that throughout my life, I've had access to opportunities I never would have had I been non-white. I've also made a few really bad decisions. Had I been non-white, any one of them could have destroyed my future. One of the things that Chelsea talks about in the documentary is that she was a very wild child in her teens. She basically ran away from home and was living with her black boyfriend and his family. He was dealing drugs. They were caught three separate times holding. He was arrested she was told to go back to her neighborhood. Upon coming to that realization, I had what's a very common reaction, guilt, 
and defensiveness. Okay, you've made me feel terrible, now what? Am I supposed to tear myself down in order to atone for the accident of the privilege I was born with? And that was where I was for a long time. In her essay, Explaining White Privilege to a Broke White Person, Gina Crossley Corcoran acknowledges that, quote, it is impossible to deny that being born with white skin in America affords people certain unearned privileges in life that people of another skin color simply are not afforded. She goes on to point out, however, that, quote, this is not said to make white people feel guilty about their privilege. It's not your fault you were born with white skin and experienced these privileges. But whether you realize it or not, you do benefit from it. And it is your fault if you don't maintain awareness of that fact. She then goes on to expand the conversation. I, maybe more than most people, can completely understand why broke white folks get pissed when the word privilege is thrown around. As a child, I was constantly discriminated against because of my poverty, and those wounds still run very deep. But luckily, my education introduced me to a more nuanced concept of privilege, the term intersectionality. The concept of intersectionality recognizes that people can be privileged in some ways and definitely not privileged in others. There are many different types of privilege, not just skin color privilege, that impact the way people can move through the world or are dis discriminated against. These are all things you are born into not things you earned, that afford you opportunities others may not have. For example, citizenship, class, sexual orientation, sex, ability, gender. Belonging to one or more category of privilege, especially being a straight, white, middle-class, able-bodied male, can be like winning a lottery you didn't even know you were playing. But this is not to imply that any form of privilege is exactly the same as another, or that people lacking in one area of privilege understand what it's like to be lacking in other areas. Race discrimination is not equal to sex discrimination, and so forth. And listen, recognizing privilege doesn't mean suffering guilt or shame for your lot in life. Nobody's saying that straight, white, middle-class, able-bodied males don't work hard for what they have. Recognizing privilege simply means being aware that some people have to work much harder just to experience the things you take for granted, if they can ever experiencing, experience them at all. There are a million ways I experience privilege, and some that I certainly don't. But thankfully, intersectionality allows us to examine these varying dimensions and degrees of discrimination while raising awareness of the results of multiple systems of oppression at work. So the first key takeaway that this gave to me was this. Those of us who experience privilege do not need to be ashamed or guilty, but we do need to acknowledge it as well as the struggles of those of us, of those around us without it. A few years ago, an eighth grader named Royce Mann in the US created quite a stir. During a spoken word event at his posh private school, he presented his poem, White Boy Privilege, of which I'll quote the beginning and the end. Dear women, I'm sorry. Dear black people, I'm sorry. Dear Asian Americans, dear Native Americans, dear immigrants who come here seeking a better life, I'm sorry. Dear everyone who isn't a middle or upper class white boy, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've started life on the top of the ladder while you were born on the first rung. I say that I would change places with you in an instant, but if given the opportunity, would I? Probably not. Because to be honest, being privileged is awesome. 
I'm not saying that you and me on different rungs of the ladder is how I want it to stay. I'm not saying that any part of me has for a moment even liked it that way. I get that change can be scary, but equality shouldn't be. Hey, white boys, it's time to act like a woman, to be strong and make a difference. It's time to let go of that fear. It's time to take that ladder and turn it into a bridge. After a video of his poem went viral, Mann was interviewed by a number of news outlets. During his interview on CNN, he commented on what he wanted. I'm not asking anybody to give up their lives to fight for equality. I have other dreams too. I'm just asking you to try to be an ally. Do your share. When you see something that is wrong, that's discrimination, speak up. Toward the end of her documentary, Handler also turns to the question of what concrete things white people can do. Melina Abdullah, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, offered this. I always say that there can't just be black people advocating for black people because, to be honest with you, the way this country is moving, and yes, she's in the US, they don't really care what black people say. So we need everybody's voice talking in their own communities. One of Abdullah's colleagues added, as a white person, it's not just that one meeting or being present in activist spaces, but also when you go to your white job or when you see your white friends, it's about advocating in all spaces, even times when it makes you uncomfortable. And that's the second big takeaway that I got from watching that and doing some further reading. In the contexts of the privileges we each have, we need to be constant allies to those who don't share those privileges. Contrary to the beliefs of many people, this is not a zero sum game. Helping others to gain the same level of privilege we enjoy does not bring us down. I'm not saying it's easy though. The right thing seldom is. It looks like we have a little time, just a little. I thought that this was actually going to run a good bit longer and I was like, oh, well then we probably won't have time for discussion but we're actually doing okay. <sighs> I, I did have probably another hour's worth of stuff I could have said. <laughs> but I tried to distill it down and, and really it was those, those two things that stood out for me. Now, I, I would like to open the floor to comments. I might be able to answer questions. I don't know. Shreen? Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it reminded me of um, about mm, 35 years ago, um, I received a, a present from a, a very close and dear friend. Her name was Eddie Harperty Ramsden. Um, she was a, a, a Māori who was one of the very few Māori who, um, who trained with me in Wellington as a nurse. Um, she went on to do a PhD in cultural safety. Um, the book was by Patricia Grace. It was a series of short stories. And inside the cover, Uri Hapati had written, Welcome to my New Zealand, Shireen, because I'd been part of that white privileged class and I was blind, as we all were in the um, 50s and 60s growing up in New Zealand, that Maori people experienced a very different New Zealand. And that was the beginning of uh, opening my eyes to my privilege and how Maori were treated by, once again, the British, I'm afraid, when they came here. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for reminding me that uh, those same things exist in New Zealand.
I guess I, I will remark that pretty much all of my sources, obviously the, the um, documentary itself was US produced and was US focused. But when you do a search on the term white privilege using one of those search engines managed by US based companies, here's a big surprise. Almost everything you get has to do with white privilege in the US. Hi, I'm Vivian. Um, some of you might have, I might have mentioned this before, but my blonde blue eyed daughter when she was about 17, 18 maybe, um, had a slight ac car accident and was stopped by the police. And they um, said, oh, are you okay dear? And you're all right? And oh yes, the car's okay. And well, you better make, make sure you get home okay. When she got home, I said, what? Did she realise how privileged she was? Because the car was actually her boyfriend. He's an um, Arab, Syrian. And she had no licence. And they didn't even ask for her licence. I think she might have had one of those, you know, you, you just pass the first few things. And she said, oh, don't be silly, you know. Imagine if he had been driving that car, the difference. They would have asked him for his licence for sure. So white privilege is alive and well. Um, one of the things that helped me see my privilege was, and this has probably been the most helpful to me, um, let's see, Larry's seven now, so t five years ago, um, I met a woman through the church we were attending then, uh, and she is mixed race. Her mother is white, her father is black. Um, and we became good friends. Um, and it's through her friendship and seeing the differences between her life and my life that has really, for me, shown me how privileged I am. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and tell the story. Um, one day I was... Um, I had her in the car and both of my daughters in the car. We'd gone over to her cousins who lived in state-sponsored housing um, to pick some things up and, you know, we sat, chatted. As we're driving out, I rolled through the stop sign. I do that sometimes. And I got pulled over. I didn't even see him. And I'm just sitting here going, what did I do? And I'm watching in the rearview mirror as the policeman gets out of his car and steps forward. And I could literally see the moment where he could see me clearly and go, and you could, I just see in his eyes, oh, white woman, two white kids in the car, I'm not getting anything. He had stopped me simply to check my license to see if I had outstanding warrants. The assumption being that I was coming out of state housing, I had and that I would be black and I would be in trouble with the law somehow. And if I remember correctly as a minor detail on that, there wasn't actually a stop sign. It's pulling out of a driveway in the US. It's, it's a give way, not a stop. So technically he had no cause to stop her at all and he was really counting on the person driving not to know that. <laughs> if you want to know what white privilege is, wear a collar. <laughs> <laughs> Your story reminded me, Tess, of a time when I was, had been at the hospital and to uh, check on one of my parishioners who was having surgery that morning. And my mind was, on, on them as I left the hospital. And so I was maybe exceeding the speed limit a little bit. Anyway, a cop was out in the middle of the road pulling me over. And uh, he looked pretty uh, intimidating, as I recall. And uh, he came up to the uh, car and uh, said, do you know I pulled you over? And I said, probably I was exceeding the speed limit. And he says, yeah. But then he noticed my collar. He says, oh, do you know Father so-and-so? And, I, <laughs> and 
And, and I thought, this was the Catholic part of town, but he turned out to be an Anglican. Or, <laughs> and so uh, I did get a, a ticket. It was uh, for driving without my license that he never asked me for. And all I had to do was prove that I had a license. So, <laughs> but even funnier is I was on a youth, taking youth to uh, New York City for an activity. And when going through the Lincoln Tunnel, you can't change lanes. And I was sleepy, and I changed lanes. And I got stopped by another intimidating cop. And I'm in sweatsuit, and you know, it's something that th I just threw on to get the kids over there. And he gets my license, uh, which had my collar on it, and he gave me <laughs> He gave me grief for not wearing it, <laughs> but I got no ticket. Membership has its privileges. Uh, my name's David. I, I was brought up in Invercargill where there's an amazing sort of lack of anybody other than white. I, I mean, there are a few Maori there, but not, not very many. And so, for me to come to the North Island and to be surrounded by a whole lot more people of colour was, was very charming, very interesting, but challenging. And I guess re just reflecting on this, I'd comment that one of the things that I think is probably very impactful, or has been very impactful for me, is just simply to get to know some Māori people very well. And I'd really encourage anybody, if you have an opportunity, to sort of really become close friends, close allies with somebody. It's a very uplifting experience. And, very interesting. I also feel a little bit wary about that, bearing in mind things like Paul Simon ripping off African songs, and there's this whole thing about us benefiting from contact with indigenous people and without them getting the, the, the corresponding benefits. But I think there are ways to be good friend, ally, and to be hugely uh, better and full. Thank you, David. I guess compare and contrast Paul Simon's appropriation with, say, Peter Gabriel, who brought entire singing groups on tour with him because he was using some of their music. Do you have a comment? Um, in 1974, right, I was about to go to law school and I came from a, I, I grew up in a Polynesian area, which is Ponsonby. And, of course, a lot of my mates are Polynesian and Maori. And the thing I found really interesting, how you don't notice stuff, is um, we were playing pool and billiards together with a friend of mine who's, in fact, his father was the founder of the King Cobras. Anyway, the thing I'm getting at is we're just sitting there playing pool and for whatever reason I turned around and said, if you could have anything in the world or be, or be anyone in the world, what would it be? And he said, to be white like you. Thank you. All right, we might have time for one more comment. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll just very, be very quick because what David was talking about reminded me of the book Blink, which goes through all of the assumptions that we make about anybody who is different. Um, from us and at the end it does give that um, suggestion that if if there is this feeling of difference the one thing you do is you make relationships with those people who um, at first seem different look I'll just end on a, on a lighter note and I'll just tell you what Miriam asked me last night uh, when she was sitting here looking at all us people at the auction she said, in Brazil, anyone in, everyone in retirement has to turn up at the bank at least once a year to prove that they're still alive. Do you have to do that in New Zealand? I said, no, I don't think so. Yeah, there's, there's a story related to that. That I believe it was in Japan, the local government was going to make a this huge deal about the birthday of Japan's oldest living citizen. So they went to his home and found out that he had died 30 years earlier. <laughs> but they were still collecting his benefits. 
The Anglican Church Pension Fund asks me every year if I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> so you still there? You still there? And, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and add a last comment before we close. When you look at us as a group, we tend to be pretty white. And we also are, have a, a very strong proportion of expats from elsewhere. That's not really a coincidence because privilege is at work in immigration everywhere. And for my closing words, may we see all as it is, and may it all be as we see it. May we be the ones to make it as it should be. For if not us, who? If not now, when? This is answering the cry of justice with the work of peace. This is redeeming the pain of history with the grace of wisdom. This is the work we are all called to do, and this is the call we answer now. To be the barrier and the bridge, to be the living embodiment of our principles, to be about the work of building the beloved community, to be a people of intention and a people of conscience.